I'm Liz Citron. Uh, I've been working in digital for the last 25 years. I've worked in a wide variety of organizations, from minuscule to vast government departments. Um, so I've, I've worked uh, client side, I've worked agency side, I've worked um, in, in um, businesses for profit and, 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 uh, and, and not for profit. Um, and uh, what what I've noticed is over over the and and, and I've also sorry um, I've I've also worked as a practitioner and also as a leader, and what I've I've found is that I've spent an inordinate amount of my time supporting colleagues and and people in my teams, so much so that I've I've changed career really and I've moved from being a, a user experience a designer to to being a coach. Um, because I, I felt that I was doing that um, without any training, so I went out and I learned how to do that, and that, that's what I do for all the time now. And to be clear, coaching is about letting people, um, facilitating people really, to hear themselves think and understand what's going on inside themselves so that they can make decisions that are the right decisions for them. And um, I it, it's important to sort of differentiate the, the um, coaching from therapy and from mentoring. So um, coaching and therapy both look at, um, you know, your behavior and what you're doing, but therapy tends to dwell more in the past, and coaching is more about what are we going to do now, um, from now on, how are we going to get you to where you want to get to. And mentoring is different to coaching because... Um, when you go to see a mentor, they, they give you lots of advice and you get all the benefit of all the experience they have. Whereas uh, with a coach, a coach can really coach about anything. Um, and I tend to coach in, in the digital world, but the thing is the coach doesn't have to have the sort of, know the inner workings of, um, of uh, you know, of, of the industry. And the reason I called this talk rolling with the punches is because I thought that we need to, as, as an industry, we need to be more prepared for things not going you know, the way that we need them to be and to be more resilient, um, like boxers who, you know, when they know a punch is coming, they tend to sort of lean back and it, it, it diminishes the impact. So we need to get more skilled at, at doing that ourselves. Um, you know, because our focus really is about making other people's lives easier, but it doesn't mean that our lives are necessarily easy. So it's important for us to, um, to focus on that. So in the world of work, and anywhere, stuff, you know, stuff that isn't great happens. Um, you know, you get office politics. You know, we've had references in earlier talks about, you know, sort of leaders and, and, and budget holders telling us how we're going to do something and, and, and we, we don't have much say in how, how we do those things. Um, and, and we have decisions that are, we feel are wrong made uh, by more senior stakeholders and, and, and that can make you feel very disempowered. Um, we have inconsistent project sponsorship. I've certainly worked on projects where I've had, you know, the budget's been cut and, and the project's been canned with one day's notice, um, or you sometimes have um, stakeholders who don't really understand what you're doing and, and, they, and they make demands that really don't make sense and are very disheartening if you've thrown your heart and soul into what you're doing um, and, then, and then you're being forced to do something that you don't really agree with. And of course, in the course of a career, you're going to have career disappointments, you're going to have gone for your dream job, and you know maybe you don't get it. And even worse, it could be that it went to, first to somebody who you didn't think it was as skilled as you. Um, another issue is sometimes you work on projects where um, they're so secret and they're so critical to the organization you're working for that actually you're never allowed to talk to them. So it doesn't go into your portfolio. And, and, and you can have spent a year or two working on something and, and not being able to really enjoy it and, and, and celebrate it publicly. And, and, and when you're working with people, there are always going to be some poor behavior. There's going to be some bullying. There's going to be people saying the wrong things. There's going to be stuff. And so this, this kind of, um, just the, the work environment can be really tough. 
And the, and the environment that we work in, is, I think, is particularly tough because things move really, really fast. You know, technologies are moving at a, a terrific clip, and, and uh, you know, there are technologies that, that you know, were so important 10 years ago and nobody's even heard of them. Like, who uses Flash anymore? But the thing is, at the time, you know, th th that was the be-all and end-all, and, and now it's gone. And, and so there's a lot of pressure on us as pract practitioners. Have I? Back. I'm back. Oh, good. Um, you know, we need to be able to keep up with all of that. And there are, there are three other things that I thought we should consider as well. Is um, There have been some discussions about it in other talks, but the, what we're called, and I'm talking about designers really, there's a, there's a wide variety of names. I, I found a survey where um, 200 people in the United States and in Europe uh, who all work in, in what we might call sort of UX design were asked to, to say what the, their job title was. And they got 70 different job titles back. And the, why I think that that's important is, is because it's quite stressful when you're looking for a job or you want to change what you're doing. You don't, it's very hard to keep track of um, what you should be. It's hard to job search. It's hard to know whether what you do is similar to what someone else does. And, and, and certainly in my, my time, I've gone from being a, well, when I started, there wasn't a name. And then we were information architects, I think. And then we became sort of, you know, um, I think we were, uh, UX designers, and now we've got service designers and product designers, and I think it makes it difficult when you're trying to establish whether you, you're skilled and, and you, you have transferable skills if, if the names and the job descriptions change too much. Um, and, and also, uh, what we do isn't very well established. So, you know, we had uh, earlier, uh, Nick referred to whether designers code or not. Um, so that, that's an interesting thing. When I first started, they did, and then they didn't have to anymore, which I thought was a great relief. And then now um, we're back to considering whether they should, and should designers research? You know, it's a big debate. And also, do designers do visual design or don't they? There, there are lots of sort of um, camps of design. And so what, what the concern is really about, those are massive competency areas and skills. I mean, you know, visual design takes four years to acquire. And so what, what is it that we should be doing and how should we be crafting our careers? Um, what skills should we be going for and, 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 and what, what, are, what skills are okay to, to, to not worry about? And the third element, I think, is that what we know keeps changing as well. Um, so there's this, there's, it, there are times when we feel like we have a body of knowledge that we have and we share. Um, it's often called best practice, which I'm not a fan of because I don't believe in the fact that anything that you know from publishing can be applied to banking, but that's another story. Um, but there are also um, a, a lot of myths and legends. There's a great website uh, called UX Myths, which I do recommend you have a look at, you know, where they, you, you can see the history of, of certain myths. Um, we've, you know, there's, when I first started, you weren't allowed to have any page scrolling. And so the, the idea was that everything had to be encapsulated in the first screen. Well, on certain sites, that's absolutely impossible. But stakeholders are still b often believe that that's, that's true. And it's taken, you know, it's, it's very exhausting to try and, and persuade people that, um, you know, that actually users, you know, we've got the evidence, users do scroll. Um, and, and so I, th I think it, it puts a lot of pressure on us as, um, as practitioners. And, and so the end result is that it's, it's, it's easy to feel like you're getting punished for doing the right thing. I think Nick, in particular, was alluding to the fact that, you know, there's a lot of arguments can happen in the workplace. It's easy to feel burnt out and disillusioned. Um, and and it, it's an issue for our industry that, that I don't think that we, we acknowledge as much as we should. Um, so what I'm here to talk about is resilience, about um, us being able to be able to sort of flex and stay positive when things aren't going 100% brilliantly, to be able to, you know, roll with the punches and stand up for ourselves when we need to, and to, to, to flourish in the workplace um, in, instead of feeling sometimes really quite overwhelmed. So 
resilience has four components. Um, it's got the physical side, which is about um, getting enough exercise, getting enough, um, f you know, eating the right food and getting an enough sleep. It's, it's important for us to sort of look after ourselves because it helps us think clearly and it helps us perform at our best. On the, on the mental side, it's important for us to learn new things and nudge ourselves out of our comfort zone a little bit um, because if we do that, we'll be much more flexible in our thinking, we'll have much more perspective, and we'll be better at problem solving, which is really what our jobs are about. On the emotional side, it's important to see, see the positive, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, and also to try and put ourselves in other people's shoes, in, in the workplace rather than it, as our day jobs, if you see the difference, um, because that gives you um, a sense of confidence in yourself, you know, as, and you, you feel like you can trust your instincts more, and you can manage your feelings and impulses, which is really, really important. And on the social side, it's just really critical that you, you, ha you have a good social network, you, you get out, you, you have positive relationships, um, because that boosts your oxytocin levels, um, and it makes you feel good, it's, and, and that's, that's really important. Um, it's worth discussing the fact that um, we think we have one brain, but we actually have three. Um, we have, uh, and, and, and this, it, this has come about be, because of the way that we've evolved. Um, so the inner brain, the, the, um, the reptilian brain, was our first brain, and it, it's what we share with very, very small animals. Um, and its, its main responsibility is to keep us safe. And its sense of what our being safe is isn't necessarily our intellectual understanding of safe. So if something looks frightening or threatening, if somebody challenges you at work, it's possible for that brain to kick in really, really quickly because it works at a lightning fast pace. And outside of that is the mammalian brain, um, which is what we share with uh, bigger animals, and it's responsible for feeling, for motivation, for interaction, and for memory. So more like a dog or, or something like that. And then on, on the outside, we have the primate brain, which is what we share with the monkeys. That's what we consider our, to be our human side, um, and that, that helps us with thinking, with language, empathy, and the inhibition of responses. So you've got a dynamic between the brains as well. You've got the lightning fast reptilian brain, um, but you've got the, the, the primate brain that tries to sort of manage and resolve um, some of that um, over-responsive behavior with the reptilian brain. But like I say, it's faster than, it, it, it's the one that responds the quickest. And so if you've ever had that experience where you, something happens, you do something, and you think, I have no idea why I behaved like that. It's because your inner lizard has got in there really fast and taken over. Um, but the good news is that um, you, there are things that you can do to, um, to make your inner lizard feel safer. Um, and I've got five examples of things that you can do in your spare time um, that are researched and, and we, we, we can definitely say contribute to helping you stay more, um, more resilient and more flexible and positive under pressure. So there is a ton of research about positive feelings and having a sense of, of feeling good and positive about yourself. Um, and, and there's evidence that it helps people cope better, it helps uh, keep them healthy, um, it can definitely help uh, reduce depression and so on. And, and so an exercise that you can try at any time and you're feeling a little bit down is to, and actually this is something that I, I once was in a position where I had a, um, I just resigned from a job I was very unhappy with, and I live in South London, and I cycled into central London 
every day. And as I went over Waterloo Bridge, I would do this exercise. And so I'd start off in the morning feeling really discouraged. And by the time I got to Waterloo Bridge, I would just think of two or three people who I knew thought I was really great. And we've all got people like that, or you know, you can always put, you know, make one of them your, your pet or something like that. And just soak up, um, just literally immerse yourself in that wonderful feeling of being respected and admired by those people. And what happens is you feel, you just get such a boost. I used to get to work ready for action, ready for anything, because that just buoys your feelings about yourself and, and, and makes you feel good. It's, it's very worth trying and it's very easy to do anytime, anywhere. There's no telltale signs, no one will know you're doing it. Um, I don't know if people have heard of Amy Cuddy. Uh, she's a, a, a researcher. It, I've, I've put a link in here um, to her TED Talk. And she's done a lot of work around um, the fact that the body can lead the mind. And it, it, she talks about fake it until you make it, but I, I don't think that's really um, how I describe it. It's the fact that you can, what she suggests is that if you, if you strike, when you're really confident and you're feeling really powerful, you, you take up more space. And so she's suggesting you overdo that. You, you literally take up space for two minutes. You just hold a, a super, you know, it's like Superman position. Um, and, and you can come out feeling much more powerful. And a great way of using this is if you've got a really worrying meeting or if you've got um, an interview, you can excuse yourself five minutes before Go in the bathroom, nobody can see you, strike your power pose, and you'll, you'll, not only will you come across, well, you, not only will you come back feeling really buzzy and really confident about yourself, but you will also, you, you will be interpreted as being much more buzzy and confident about yourself as well, which obviously will help the interview go well. A, a third thing you can do, um, we talked a little bit about mindfulness. Uh, there's, there's a huge amount of research has happened in mindfulness. Uh, now that we can, um, we can photograph what's going on in, 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 in our brains, um, there's evidence that um, just doing a small amount of meditation um, can restructure your brain. And it, it, what's great about it is it's cumulative as well. So once you've done one and a half hours of mindfulness, um, that the, 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 that the benefits of that can last for months. So it's not like the Amy Cuddy stuff where you have to be kind of quick and drag, you know, get in the meeting fast. The, you know, doing the mindfulness will um, will have a long will will stay with you for a very long time. And the whole idea of mindfulness is really to give detach yourself from your thoughts, and you can and, and that detachment um, actually introduces a moment of pause where you can think about what you want to do um, and it stops your, it, it, it gives you a moment to think about your reptilian brain response before you dive in and do the thing that you are surprised that you've done. And it's, the evidence suggests that it's, it's really good at reducing stress um, and, 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 and there are studies to suggest that it wards off cancer as well. So, this is something I really love. This is, um, you know, f finding your why, finding your, your reason for being. It, it, it's, um, it, if you get it right, if you, if you do the work, you can, um, it's like your radar. It tells you where you should go, where you shouldn't go, what job you should take, whether you should stand up for yourself in a meeting, because you understand what you're about. Um, and it also, the evidence suggests that it, it, you know, it can keep you living longer, it can ward off Alzheimer's, you know, what's not to like. And the way it works is um, you, you find, you know, what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for, and what the world needs. And, and the critical thing is that actually it, um, it doesn't have to be, there's a, the Japanese call it ikigai, and and their view is it doesn't actually have to be that phenomenal. It can be, there are examples in the Japanese stories of it being just looking after your grandchildren or whatever. It can be a very small thing, but it's having a purpose. It just helps you, um, like I say, it's like, your, it's like your compass. It helps you navigate your life. Um, it makes a very big difference. And lastly, um, an exercise that 
I recommend that you uh, it employ because I think it, it, it improves your happiness, so back to the first uh, example, is, is about thinking about how you tell your stories to yourself and to others. Because um, that really reflects on your outlook and how positively you feel. So sometimes it's, it's worth spending time when you thinking about s stories that you tell yourself that are negative. You know, something you've done where you did something foolish or you spilt coffee on yourself or you missed the last train home at the Christmas party. And, and it's worth spending time thinking about how you can rewrite that story in your mind to flip it over to being positive. So with the missing the train story, well, maybe the outcome was that you had to stay with a work colleague and stay at, at their house, and it was an opportunity to get to you know, increase your network and make a new friend. So actually, that's the silver lining, rather than focusing on the, God, why was I so stupid um, version of the story. The question um, I think you may have in your mind is, how am I going to remember how to do these things? Uh, B.J. Fogg has been mentioned a few times, uh, but all slightly differently every time today when he's been mentioned. Um, I've got a link to his website, but he's also got a TED Talk. And he has a very simple approach. It's called Tiny Habits. And um, it's very, very simple, but you have to do all three things. So you might, what you, the first thing to do is pick a, 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 a tiny behavior. So let's say you want to get fitter. So the tiny behavior could be, I will do one press-up. Um, and then you find a habit that is in your control, so it's not like when the phone rings, I will do this thing, but you, you say, um, after I've brushed my teeth, um, and you, you, you combine those two to say, after I brush my teeth, I will do one push-up. Um, and then as soon as you've done the push-up, you find your way of celebrating, so it's like, yes. Um, and you have to do all three things. And it, it, it very quickly, um, I took part in a study of his, and it's true, it's very easy. To, the habit um, just sort of builds by itself. And, and the way it really works effectively is while you're down there doing one push-up, you probably might as well do five or 10, or that's probably as many as I'm able to do, but however many you can do. Um, and, and so that's, that's a way of, of introducing um, some of the ideas that I've given. Uh, and into your life and, and, and keeping them there. So I, I just um, wanted to leave you with a thought from Helen Keller, who is very well known in the United States, but not so much here in the UK. She was um, born in 1880, perfectly normal child. Unfortunately, by the time she was two, she had something along the lines of measles and she lost her sight and her hearing completely. And instead of you know, going to rot at an institution, uh, she learned to, um, to read and she learned to uh, write uh, you know, with sort of the signing. She did the sort of physical signing as opposed to visual signing. Um, and she, she became um, you know, very active in, in, in trying to improve the, um, the opportunities for people with disabilities. And, and, and her view is, is um, you know, when, when things go wrong for us and, and, and we become unhappy, we spend so too much time bemoaning the, um, the fact that the door is closed, but we don't realize that another door has opened for us. And, and, and resilience is about accepting what's happened and, 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 um, and, and looking for, okay, so that's that, where to now, and, you know, um, and, and keeping going. So just before I go, I just wanted to say that uh, I mentioned um, coaching. I'm really passionate about it. I think it's really life-changing. Um, there's a lot of you here, so this is a little bit of an ambitious offer. But um, I would like to offer at least <laughs> the first few, of, so many of you, but possibly, I think there's 400 people here, so maybe not 400 people. But give me a call. This is a way you can get in, or get in touch, and I'd be happy to, to spend an hour um, giving you the experience of coaching so you can see for yourself how useful it is. Thank you.